you doing, folks? This is Mitch from Hard Intentions YouTube channel. We also have HardIntentions.com where we sell our products like shirts, hats, beanies, and prints of my artwork and some original art. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, go check us out at HardIntentions.com. Uh, we have a print of our Native American painting and the motorcycle stuff available and uh, also beanies, all that good stuff. And we got a beanie air from Hot Rod 209 Hot Rod Events. Thank you for the care package. <laughs> <coughs> so, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody on the phone today uh, who've been in the pen. Some of you guys know him. He's talking to Whack about things, you know. And, uh, you know, he talked to some of his homeboys that have gotten out recently and, uh, you know, they, they created these 50-50 yards or mixed yards or program yards now in prison. And uh, I guess it's changed the whole dynamic of prison since I've gotten out. Um, a few things have happened. You know, the, uh, all the prison gang members were locked up indeterminately in the hole. Segregation or shoe units. Um, the federal courts uh, ruled that that's illegal. They can only keep a guy in the hole now for five years maximum. So things have changed. You know, they created uh, the SNY yards for having gangs. And now the prison gang members are all out of the hole. And so uh, they created what they refer to now as uh, program yards and non-program yards. <coughs> and so... I guess what's happening, man, is uh, there's no accountability on the uh, on the program yards because they have formerly SNY and GP guys mixing on the same yard, and so uh, you have guys who checked in for various reasons. Some of them were victims. Some of them were, uh, you know, sex offenders. Some of them owed a lot of drug debt. Some of them were gang dropouts. And now they're mixing with guys who are GP who want to program and go home. Uh, I assume mostly on level twos, I guess some some level threes and level ones, they're they're all mixing now. And so on the GP yards, uh, you have a concentration of guys who are not gonna go for that shit. They call them non program yards. Or what used to be general population. Uh, non S and Y yards. <laughs> and that's <coughs> excuse me. I'm still getting over a cold. <coughs> for some of you guys know I have valley fever so when I get a cold it takes forever for me to hack all that crap out of my lungs anyway so you have a concentration of guys who are non-programmers in the staff size and of course on the program yards you have uh, informants guys that are working for the staff there's no accountability you know um, but we were talking about prison how it used to be you know and uh you know, when I went to prison, you know, I got arrested in 1979. And, uh, but prior to that, I was in youth authority. And the last youth authority I was at was Preston. And I used to communicate with guys who were in Tracy. Um, I had some friends there that I knew from youth authority who went to prison. They were in Tracy. And uh, if you were white, Tracy was a really terrible place, man. Um, you know, myself and some other guys, uh, since we've been released, I noticed that a lot of guys have overcome, uh, you know, the racial, uh, I would say anger and sometimes hatred. They've overcome that and just uh, kind of accepted life out here in its own terms and they accept people for what they are and how they act because we're no longer in prison. Um, but I was telling Whack, you know, about prison, man. I said, I, you know, I have a friend, you know, and he told me he was at Tracy, you know, in, in, uh, in the 70s. I think he went there in 74. <clears throat> and uh, he said, look, you know, when he's from L.A., you know, and uh, and uh, he's a motorcycle rider. Uh, he was in a club. And he said, you know, Smiley, before I went to prison, hey, I didn't have any racial problems. I wasn't prejudiced. I wasn't racist. None of that shit. And he still isn't now, now that he's out, you know. he's, uh, But... Uh, you know, and he went to Tracy and he, he said, look, man, uh, them dudes referring to, you know, blacks and the Northern Hispanic gang, uh, you know, they were stabbing white dudes and killing white dudes on a regular basis. And, you know, he never experienced that either. And, uh, 
you know, he was in Tracy with some guys that I know from my hometown who, who uh, they're pretty stand-up dudes, who, uh, some of whom got out, two of them I know got out and joined Motorcycle Club in San Diego. Um, you know, they're stand-up dudes. Uh, so they're in Tracy, and, you know, guys used to gamble and, and do different stuff, you know, and, and uh, I mean, just the same thing that goes on on the street, but guys gamble as a pastime and for money. And, uh, you know, you have a guy that runs a gambling table. Uh, he's the house. He gets paid for running the table, you know. Uh, you know, kind of like on The Sopranos. You know, they got a guy running a gambling thing, you know. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> you know, the house makes sure everybody gets paid. And so, uh, you know, these dudes uh, from this... Uh, this northern uh, Hispanic prison gang, they roll up on these dudes and they tell them, hey, man, uh, you know, we want a third of what comes off this table. And, then, you know, these dudes are like, man, you know, yeah, okay. You know, these are stand-up men, you know. But, uh, I mean, it got to the point where these guys had the whites so outnumbered and a lot of the white dudes were so fucking scared. Um... You know, I heard cases of uh, they try to extort guys out of money and they tell them, you know, fuck you. So they would get a visit and, and uh, these dudes would get visits and they'd have their visitor follow uh, follow the guy that said, fuck you. They'd follow his visitor out of the visit room, uh, catch him at a stoplight and then shoot him, kill him. You know, I mean, that's how bad it was. And, and it was uh, it was so bad, man, that, uh, you know, they'd be stabbing you and uh the cops would run up and grab you and drag you away. And while the cops are dragging you away, there'd be two or three guys stabbing you while the cops are dragging you down the corridor. And that's how vicious it was. Um, you know, I experienced some stuff like that in prison when I was in prison, not, not on that level. Tracy was on a whole nother level. Um, you know, it was a vicious place to be. It was scary. A lot of guys uh, PC'd up. A lot of guys uh, were scared to death, man. And... Um, it was to the point where, like, they started this thing called the New White Family, and they had white dudes that would side up with the, with these uh, prison gangs that were, uh, <coughs> you know, Northern Hispanics and blacks, and uh, they would be hanging around white dudes and uh, listening to their conversation about maybe plotting to get some revenge, and then they'd go and tell the prison gang dudes, hey, these white dudes are going to, you know, do this, that, and the other, and they'd tell them who there was, and then they would go stab them before they had a chance to get off. So them dudes, uh, needless to say, were in the hat. Um, when I was in San Quentin, one of them popped up, and uh, and they stabbed the piss out of them. Uh, you know, so, I mean, Tracy was a really bad place, man, and uh, it, was, it was bad. Dudes, you know, understandable. Guys were scared. Guys were worried. Guys are wondering, uh, you know, you, you heard my interview with Rhino, man. He was there when I had a riot. Dude's, you know, dude said he straight shit his pants. It's a scary thing to live around, man. And so, uh, you know, uh, guys don't understand that. Um, so when they uh, came to say, hey, we want a third of this gambling table, uh, you know, they kind of, got together, and uh, from what I understand, you know, I talked to a lot of guys that were there when it happened, and one of my friends actually organized it, had photographs of the riot from the incident report and all that. Uh, you know, they, they went out to the yard, <clears throat> and uh, they have an equipment window, and you're allowed to have one baseball bat to play softball, and the softball field at that time was right by the equipment window, and the white dudes are playing baseball, and uh, mostly all bikers. Uh, these dudes weren't no white prison gang. They were mostly biker dudes, some regular old white dudes, you know. And uh, instead of having one baseball bat, they had uh, 25 baseball bats, I heard. And, uh, and they had knives. And so in Tracy, when you leave the yard, <clears throat> everybody walks down to a, it's a, like a curved uh, roadway and there's lines and you line up and they pat you down then you walk to a gate and it's a chain link fence and it has a chain on it. it's open but it only opens up enough for one guy to squeeze through 
you know, you push the gate and walk through. So that way there's not a mass exited off the yard, exodus off the yard into the hallway. And uh, so at yard recall, you know, these dudes, uh, this, uh, you know, Hispanic, Northern Hispanic prison gang dudes, they're walking to go line up, to go off the yard, you know, and uh, the white dudes rushed him with baseball bats and started baseball batting him and stabbing him. And uh, it was a pretty vicious deal, you know. Uh, this is something that anyone that was been in prison in the 70s, 80s, maybe even early, excuse me, early 90s might have heard about this. But, uh, you know, them dudes from the prison gang, dudes, they were tossing their knives and trying to run off the yard. And a and, uh, guy was laughing that was telling me the story because he said they were all trying to squeeze through that gate, you know. And, uh, you know, they got their ass handed a, a lesson, you know. And uh, so while they were locked down, you know, they locked the whole prison down. And uh, during lockdown, um, uh, Tracy had at that time four windows and one of them's out so you could pass mail through there. And uh, so they let two guys out on each tier to shower at a time, same race, you know, so they would shower the whites at one time, blacks another time, whatever. But uh, guys came out on the tier and threw uh, gasoline, turpentine bombs, uh, match bombs, you know, with shrapnel, nails, whatever they could get uh, into these guys' cells. They threw them through the window or under the door because the doors had a pretty big gap, you know. So they firebombed as many of these guys as they could uh, uh, while during shower time. <coughs> and... Uh, and uh, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Staff ended up uh, locking all of them up, the, the prison gang dudes. And that was uh, that was the end of that, you know. And then later on, they, they were like, you know, we want to come back to the main line. And Staff said, well, you know, you want to go to San Quentin or Folsom, you know, you're not coming back to this main line. Because they had run them up there for many years, you know. Um, that was like their headquarters, I guess. But, uh, you know, I have another friend. He was in that prison. Uh, he's out now. He did 45 years. Uh, he got stabbed five times in one year. <clears throat> one time got hit with a homemade hatchet uh, by black prison gang uh, members, you know. Um, and uh, they used to call him Buddy Holly. He was 16 when he got busted. Did 45 years. He's out now. Um, so he'd be walking down the tier and they'd say, Hey, there's Buddy Holly. There's Buddy Holly. Let's get Buddy Holly, you know? And, and, uh, back then, you know, um, you're on the main line, you got stabbed. Uh, if you didn't rat, they put you right back in the same cell. So they were putting him right back in the same cell in the same building. Um, there's about 300 guys in the building. Uh, same place he's getting stabbed at. They're putting him right back in it, man. That's like taking you out of a lion's den patching you up and throwing you right back in it and uh so you know when I whack and I talk man uh he's like dude you know these guys nowadays they have no clue what you guys went through and, and that was prior to my time I was in Preston when this stuff was going on you know I had friends writing me and telling me hey man uh, I'm in the hole and I'm going back out to the main line and uh, <coughs> I'll probably be back in the hole in a week or two, you know, because they would go out there the main line, you know, and they just weren't having it. And, of course, uh, you know, once I finished my time in Preston and got out, within a year I was in prison. I was on my way to prison, which led me to do 38 years. Uh, but... Uh, so, you know, people ask me about my tattoos, and, and a lot of guys have, you know, white power tattoos, swastikas, lightning bolts from that era. And uh, most of them are pretty solid dudes. And uh, it was uh, it was a different time. I seen them same guys, you know, when I was younger. Uh, you know, they converse with blacks and Hispanics from from the north or whatnot, they'd sit and, <coughs> you know, have a conversation with them about something, whether it was work or, you know, what was going on in the prison, 
or whatever or some kind of deal, you know, because um, guys still did wield and deal with each other and they just like they do now. But uh, back then it was kind of known like like uh, now white dudes are kind of looked at as a mark in prison because they're the ones with the money and they're the ones that buy the dope. And they're the ones that run up thousands of dollars worth of debt and PC up. But back then, when I was in prison and prior to my, my going to prison, uh, white dudes had their own shit. And, uh, yeah, they would wheel and deal with other races, but they paid their debts. And uh, they didn't go thousands of dollars in debt. You couldn't do that back then. But uh, white dudes were not, you know, they were not fucked with, man. Um, yeah, you know, like Wack was telling somebody from out of state who was a uh, white crip, he said, you know, uh, you know, just come out of wax mouth. He's like, look, man, uh, the guy was telling me I would have, I would have been all right in California prison. And, uh, you know, he's a white crib from another state and, and whack told him, look, dude, you don't understand. Uh, you know, when I was in prison, um, you'd be on a yard with a thousand dudes. And that if there was only 20 white dudes on that yard and it was suicidal for them to attack you, they would find a way to do it. And, uh, and that's how prison was, man. Uh, you know, of course, when I was in prison, uh, my first, <coughs> you know, 10 or 15 years, <coughs> uh, nobody really cared about that kind of shit. I didn't really see any white cribs back then. But, uh, I mean, there was white dudes that were married to black chicks. And, you know, guys didn't fuck with them. They didn't spend a lot of time on the yard. But, uh. You know, you really did. They had jobs. You didn't really see them, but nobody, nobody cared about them. What their business was with their wife or whatever. You know, they weren't part of what we were doing, and we, we just, you know, guys let them do their own thing. You know, now prison's a little different. You know, uh, especially when Whack was in. Uh, you know, he had a rough time. White Crips, White Bloods had a hard time in prison. Now I guess there's a hands-off policy where um, people kind of uh recognize it's uh you know it's better just to let guys uh do their time they're not trying to be a part of what you're a part of and and whatnot but uh you know so that's that's a little bit of history about how things were you know and, and so it's a it's a testament of how far things have come uh <clears throat> you know in prison man when there's a problem it escalates fast and when you have a group of people attacking another group of people or preying on another group of people, you know, they're only going to put up with it for so long. And then, you know, eventually, I mean, if you're outnumbered, which uh, the white dudes were and Tracy at that time, uh, it takes a while to get yours, you know. Um, but eventually they got it. And, uh, but, you know, like you see the tattoos and you, and you, and you see how people were and you see, film clips of stuff, or you hear about stories, um, you know, it was a survival thing, man, guys had to survive, and, and you hear about, you know, white prison gangs formed, you know, to, for the protection of whites, that's kind of true, and, and <coughs> in some rega <coughs> regards, you know, uh, white dudes needed a structure, man, so they weren't being a uh, prey for other races, and, and that's kind of how all that started, um, you know, it was a rough time, and it's, it's, it's a lot easier now in California prisons. And that's not to say that it's easy. It's a lot easier. It's still a rough place to live, and it's a, and it's a rough way to, uh, you know, to find out, man, that, that, you know, that's not the life you want to live. But once you get sentenced to prison, you're going to have to write out that term no matter what. Uh, so... You know, you have to stay alive. And that's, you know, some guys lay down and, and lick their nuts and some guys step up to the plate, man. And and, and in the case of the baseball bat uh, incident, people stepped up to the plate fully, you know. Um, so, you know, you got to ask yourself, man, are, are you, you know, how do you want to live? I mean, if you're the kind of guy who wants to step up to the plate uh, and you're out here in the world, uh you know, you can step up to the plate in ways that don't jeopardize your freedom, uh, your family, uh, your friends, your lifestyle. Um, and what I'm saying is, <coughs> <coughs> you 
you know, like my friend Bowtie Barber, man, you know, he got in a little trouble and uh, finally realized, you know, that prison was not the way he wanted to go. He almost got struck out. Oh, he started cutting hair at someone else's barber shop. Uh, the guy who owned the barber shop kind of expressed an interest in, you know, or lack of interest in his barber shop, and, and Bowtie Barber ended up buying a shop from him. Um, you know, he stepped up to the plate and decided, hey, man, I want to live good. You know, he's got a brand new motorcycle. He's got his own pad to live in. He's got his own uh, barber shop. He employs guys. Uh, all his workers are clean and sober program type guys. Uh, when If they backslide, he puts them on restriction. You know, I mean, he stepped up to the plate and he's got a decent life. So there's a different way to step up to the plate out here in the world. Um, there's ways to step up that don't jeopardize the things in life that you want to do and the things you want to have. Uh, you know, if you're involved with criminal behavior uh, and you end up in prison, then you got to decide uh, how do you want to step up to the plate. You know, you want to be a tough guy. You want to hook up, get hooked up with the fellas. Uh, and jeopardize, you know, possibly spending your whole life in prison forever? Or do you want to step up to the plate by getting an education? And, you know, basically, all you need is a GED. If you want to go to college, and there you can, but, you know, the thing is, uh, you can learn HVAC, you can learn milling cabinet, plumbing, carpentry, <coughs> you know, <coughs> welding machine shop trade, you can learn that stuff in prison. So you can step up to the plate like that. Learn yourself a trade, get your head straight. If there's therapy av available, get that. Communicate with people, uh, you know, so when you parole, you're grounded. Mentally, physically fit, mentally fit, uh, ready to, you know, tackle the world out here when you get out. Um, but that requires you to stand on your own two feet, which is quite a challenge in a world, man, where uh, everyone's trying to be accepted by the guys that are cool, you know. Um, fortunately for me, you know, the guys that I thought were cool were uh, guys who were, uh, <coughs> you know, outlaw motorcycle riders. And outlaw motorcycle riders don't commit themselves to spending the rest of their life in prison. You know, my friend did 35 years, another friend did 45 years, I did 38 years, I had another friend did 21 years, all biker type guys. Uh, but we're all out. I mean, that's a hard road to hoe, man. And that wall, look, it was no, it was no seeing over that wall for a long time. But we, uh, you know, we kept our nose to the grindstone, man, and uh, we kept that vision of freedom and what we wanted to do with life. And here we are. We're out here. Um, you know, so just know that if you go to the pen, <clears throat> these stories like the baseball bat incident, um, there are fresh incidents happening all the time in every prison in California. Uh, you're going to be experiencing stuff like this, um, whether you're involved in it or whether you're happen to be around when it happens one way or another you're going to see it and you're going to be in it and so you know think twice about what you're doing man before you uh before you do something that could cost you dearly and uh, force you to make some decisions that you're not ready to make uh just do it do it right man do it hard whatever you decide to do it yourself step up and do it hard that's uh, that's a, that's the deal. Thank you, folks. Thanks for watching and uh, thanks for supporting our channel. We love you. Take care. Whatever it is you do, do it hard.